Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, subtitle, We're Doing Art Now. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. I'm here with Dr. Alan Jameson. You doing all right, mate? Yes, I'm fine, Thomas. Yeah, we're hanging in there. We've both somehow got colds. We might sound a little bit croaky. Also, how we got colds, we're all in lockdown. Coming up on this episode, we delve into the aesthetics of deep sea, and particularly the deep sea fish, and try and stop overthinking everything as scientists and just enjoy these animals and the sort of the gut reaction you have when you see them for the first time. And to help us do that, we have an artist, Alex Gould, who is going to help us see things for the first time all over again. Following on from that, we'll talk about maybe how they are misrepresented. And I'm going to try and defend the blobfish, which is often bullied online. And that leads nicely into our Tales from the High Sea from Dr. Heather Ritchie, who boosted morale one day when we really needed it. I've been pretty swamped this week and I've not been able to keep up with stuff. Is there any interesting deep sea in the news, Al? Yes. Good. All right. Tell me about that, because I've missed it. Well, there's three stories I found in the last couple of weeks. One was about sea lice. Not the kind of animal you'd expect to associate with the deep sea, but sea lice that live on seals and sea lions and walruses and stuff like that. We were talking a while ago about why do big air-breathing mammals suddenly decide to dive to very deep waters. And one of the ideas kicking around was maybe to do it to shed all their parasites, crush them all at depth, whatever, come back up again. But there's a group of scientists who have recently found that the sea lice are actually particularly hardy. They have the ability to survive to 2,000 metres, even though they live their entire life on seals and sea lions and walruses, which is kind of weird. But the bit I liked most about the story was there was one unfortunate little louse. <laughs> there must be a story behind this, but it was accidentally subjected to 44 megapascal pressure. <laughs> Someone moved the decimal. Accidentally, I don't know. There must be a story in there. But that means that that little louse had been subjected to equivalent of 4,000 metres depth and it survived, which is kind of interesting as to why sea lice have evolved such incredibly high pressure tolerance. But, I mean, it knocks out any any type of hypothesis regarding deep diving as a way of shedding these things, because obviously that's not going to work, because it sounds like the sea lice can go way deeper than the host. Quite what's going on there, I don't know, so keep your eye and on that. And it must be a, a fluke, it must be ha, a fluke parasite. Didn't. You know, it, it won't have evolved that in order to keep up with its host, because as far as we're aware, it's got a greater depth tolerance than its host. Do you remember the, the film Cloverfield? Yes. They put loads of effort into a biological rationale for the monster. You don't actually see a great deal of it on screen, but they wanted it to make sense. As part of all that, those little things that dropped off it were based on um, on cetacean, on, on whale and uh, marine mammal lice, like the ones you're talking about. Ooh. And those little things that attack them in the subway, that yeah. were falling off the monster. There's a whole horror film dedicated to parasitic isopods as well. Yeah, the bay. It's brilliant. The bay. Yeah. They are gross, I must admit. I've seen those isopods, they're horrible. Pretty nasty. Yeah, they end up eating the tongue of the fish, don't they? And then they just take up, the, they grow into the mouth cavity of the fish. It's horrible, and then they do something nice which just makes it extra horrible. So they latch onto the tongue, they draw the blood and fluids from the tongue until it withers, but they're then committed to that animal. They can't find another host because they enter through the gills as a larva. So they kill you, but at least they're committed to you. Well, no, this is worse. They want the host to stay alive. So they start to function as the tongue. So they allow the fish to continue to eat and swallow. It could easily block the, the mouth and kill the fish, but they don't. They start to work as the tongue so that the host survives. So you've had this little thing invade you, eat your tongue, and then... I'm your tongue now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. They are gross. I've seen them when we baited stuff before and you're sort of strapping the bait onto the camera systems and then suddenly this thing just drops out their mouth. It's like, ugh. And they're always facing forward and they're, they're like hugging the, yeah. the little nubbin that's left from the tongue. So they... They're almost cute in a in a monstrous way. I'm not sure cute is what I'd use, but... Oh, they've got that little isopod face. I don't know. I've, I've lost all track of what's cute anymore. That'll come up on this episode. So speaking of weird stuff and parasites, the other news story is about anglerfish and their immune system. So anyone who doesn't know, anglerfish are these big, weird-looking, pudding-shaped fish, famous for the big jaws and the teeth and the bioluminescent lure. But they have a really weird mating system worked out, whereby the big fish that swim around in the pelagics are mostly female, and the males are tiny. And the males come along and basically attach themselves to the side of the female. And the female eventually absorbs them. That's how they reproduce. So when you find a big female, you can see how many sexual partners she's had by the number of weird scars she's got on her body surfaces. A group of scientists are looking into this because it doesn't make any sense because your immune system should reject that. You're basically merging two animals. You're merging the male and the female. It's not a parasitic relationship as such. You're actually absorbing the other one. They found out that they actually lack 
key immune system genes that are needed to let antibodies mature and assemble receptors for immune cells and things like that. So it's, there's something really interesting going on there that other animals probably don't do because no other animal has to deal with absorbing their partners. <laughs> so like... There's pregnancy in sort of mammals and things like that, and that, that's a really interesting one for, for immunity, but nothing nothing at this level because they completely fuse the, the blood mm. supply links to the blood supply of the male. The males are essentially free-swimming testicles with incredible senses of smell. A few of them, are, well, at least we think, they, they don't actually feed at all. Their whole life is about tracking down the female. I heard they didn't have a digestive system. I think it varies, because it's... Um, yeah, there are hundreds of species of these things, eh? So. Yeah, and it's a bit of a path. You can see the, you can see the sexes becoming more disparate um, along certain lineages. So some of them, there is, a, there is a large male and female, and then other ones, there's this super evolved, super specialised parasitic male. But it's, it's... I can't think of any other examples of animals fusing so completely. Hmm. But then if you live in the midwater where the density of animals is so unbelievably low, I guess you need to do something pretty drastic to make sure. If that means absorbing your boyfriend, then so be it. <laughs> so I'm your tongue now, and if it means if you have to absorb your boyfriend, then so be it. Yes. The third story, which is quite a big one, but I'm not... I'm confused by this story because I think this is one of these stories that comes in cycles. New theory now as to the origins of life on Earth. Right, so there's this bunch of scientists who've come out and said that they now believe that to get life started, it would need a solid mineral surface, ideally something including a clay, but with sunlight and a fair bit of ultraviolet radiation and enough warmth to periodically evaporate water. That that's the kind of conditions they are saying are more likely to have led to the origin of life. Which up until now, if you don't know, the biggest sort of hypothesis for origins of life was the hydrothermal vents in the deep sea. But if you need ultraviolet light and evaporation and clay that means that this new research suggests that life didn't emerge in the deep sea vents after all. Life is probably more of a coastal thing or a terrestrial thing. I think I was taught that at undergrad. I think the, the prevalent theory then was it was sort of a clay shoreline getting lapped by waves. I mean, either way, it's going to have to be a sort of variable condition. You, you need these elements to be formed and then to sort of congeal and then be formed again. So I think they talked about the clay working a little bit as a catalyst as well, actually yeah. locking certain elements in uh, in the right position and then them sort of building up over time. But then you throw in the ultraviolet light and then you're like, oh, all right, that brings it right out of the sea. Yeah, that like, locks it down to uh, somewhere near the sun. So anyway, so there you go. There's some interesting deep sea stories from the news in the last few weeks. Oh, those are good. I, I totally missed all of those. I've uh, I've been a little bit out the loop. Well done, Tom. Finger on the pulse. Obviously. obviously. Well, we, we do this now and you can tell me all about them. Well, yeah, so I, I just sub through lots and lots of news articles and just tell you the best bits. Yeah. So I'm an echo chamber. I'm severely dyslexic, so you're my, my reading eye dog. Oh, yeah, so if I read them out, you might get it correct. Yeah, just about. I won't shuffle everything on the page and it won't cause me physical pain to read. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, that works well. So we've been getting some feedback now about the podcast. People are actually listening. Oh, maybe this will pay off. Uh, and one of the pieces of feedback was that um, we're pushing back against monsters and aliens and creatures and, and all those words they use. But uh, a few of our listeners pointed out that there are people who really engage with the deep sea purely because of that. You know, that's, that's what they think is really cool. And that makes them advocates for the deep sea. So I'm starting to wonder, you know, are we, are we getting this wrong? Are we, are we coming at this from a too much of an analytical scientific angle. We need to look at the aesthetics of these animals and how people engage with them. If only we had access to an artist. I happen to know an artist, Tom. Have you got an artist on hand? I do. I have one in my back pocket. Could we talk to your artist, Alan? Yes, we can. Because I think I'm too close to this. I think I've, I've maybe lost objectivity, which is a terrible thing to say as a scientist. Artists are good. They're, they're good. So there's one particular artist who will be our guest on the show today. Her name is Alexandra Gould, who I invited on a couple of expeditions last year. Uh, and I thought it was a really interesting thing to do. From my from my perspective, regardless of what art she produced in the end, I thought she was a really interesting person to have on board because, you know, when we're at sea doing our thing, we often bring journalists and various other people from, you know, maybe more non-scientific parts of, of the business, but they tend to ask similar questions. What I loved about Alex was when she was on board, you would absolutely no idea what question was about to come out of her mouth. And it challenges you quite a lot when you're sitting there, you're processing your samples and someone comes along and says, eh, what about that? And you're like, well, no one has ever asked me that before. And then suddenly you've got to think on your feet going, I said, why is that? I don't know, because everyone always asks about this or that or that. No one's ever asked about this particular thing. And I suppose the journalist has had to pitch the piece 
they, they've they arrived with something in mind and they're trying to deliver it and they'll have a framework and they'll try and get you to fill in those blanks. But a good artist is going to be totally blank slate. Oh, what's that? Yeah, and journalists are after stories. Artists are not after stories. It's a visual thing. It's an aesthetic thing rather than a story with a headline. Inspiration. Yeah. So I, th- I thought hanging out with, with Alex and those couple of jobs was uh, really insightful. I learned a lot anyway, and I think she learned a lot. So which which expeditions did she come on? So this was going back last year, 2019. It was part of what's called the Five Deeps Expedition. So we had this, we still do, we have this ship called Pressure Drop. And we're going around the world, and each leg we would invite people on board from either the country in which we're working near, or journalists, or, or anybody really for that matter. So we decided we wanted an artist. So I, I, Alex had contacted me about a year before about ideas for paintings, and we, she did one, which I thought was amazing. I emailed her one day and says, do you fancy coming to Tonga? <laughs> <laughs> Quick Google, but where is Quick Tonga? Tonga? Yeah, it's kind of far away, uh, but you know we'll get you down to Tonga. And she did. She came down, and we had a blast. It was brilliant. And so much so that a few months later, towards the end of it, we were up in the Arctic, up at eighty degrees north of Svalbard, and we invited her back for that. So she had a really bizarre experience in that she was parachuted in for one of the tropical South Pacific jobs, and then a few months later, she was parachuted into the Arctic with walruses and polar bears and icebergs and everything else. So. And was this the first time she'd been offshore? Yeah. Wow. It's the first time she did. I think she'd ever really hung around scientists. Oh, cool. And offshore and the whole thing. So that, that was interesting for me to just watch how she how she came into that. Yeah, and crank it right up to 11. Like, there was no North Sea survey jobs. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, yes. The dude, let's go and do something weird, do something in a weird place, and, and everything about it was weird. And she was brilliant. So I think her perspective on what we do and her perspective on where art and aesthetic plays a part in what we do is really, really fascinating. So we decided to interview her. So uh, Alex joins us now from Corsham in England. And to get started, I would like to discuss a little bit about the subject matter in which you paint and draw and photograph and sketch. And that is because I think it's really interesting that you are not like normal artists who have a quite often just have a thing. You'd be a landscape artist or a portrait artist or or someone who draws planes or whatever it may be. In your collection over the last year, I see lots of fish paintings, portraits of people, engineering pieces where I have ships and submersibles and the whole sort of deep sea environment thing. Is that a conscious thing that you've done? not pigeonhole yourself into like a portrait artist or a or a landscape artist or something like that or does that just happen accidentally um it's it's quite deliberate that i was i chose to be a portrait artist um initially and then approaching deep sea creatures like the abyssal grenadier i related to it as a as an individual fish as it sounds really peculiar but it's a portrait of an abyssal grenadier it's not a painting of a fish to me so I was trying to engage with the idea of the fish representing more than um, it being a physical animal, but more the conditions it's living in. And uh, I think that's kind of evolved. Now I see all fish and critters from the deep sea as uh, some sort of emotional relationship with them. If, if, if they could talk, if they could accuse you or their curiosity. So I think that came across there really they are portraits even though they're not people and then it's so epic being at sea and the people involved the seafaring life is completely different to anything I'd ever encountered and the range of people that are all pulling together and the whole expedition in itself is so vast and and adventurous it feels very risky and something very historic so I think that awe has fed into trying to um embody more than just people and critters but the vessels themselves take on their own personality and it's evolved and so obviously then I need to find quick ways of capturing those ideas so sketches and photography have been have been perfect for that. It's funny you say that because I I agree I I think back at all the ships I've worked on and there's some that I really love like an old friend and there's ones that I know I've never gotten on with. (laughs) <laughs> there's, there's ones that I've disliked from, from the day I've stood on it and I can't explain why. There is a weird sort of relationship you have with completely inanimate objects. But And again, the fish as well. I mean, and you mentioned curiosity there as well. I think the, the Grenadier was a perfect example of that. They are unbelievably curious. 
I don't know if you've noticed, but they obviously they have this barbel on their chin and all their tactile senses of tactile buds, if you like, are on the end of that barbel. And they do come and explore. We quite often see them on the landers all over the place. They're, 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 they do have their own little personalities. The snailfish as well, they've got their own little personality too. Of all those different elements, what's, do you have a particular favourite one? Do you, you know, do, do you prefer doing people or, or animals or, or vehicles? Is, is there a particular subject matter that you, you prefer to do? Well, before the Five Deeps expedition, I'd have said it's always been people. But the more I engaged with the fact that it's an expedition, the amount of science that's going into it and looking at the history of expeditions going back, you know, through all the deep sea dives, it's become, it's so much bigger. So I I, I really want to paint, but you, you need so many different tools in order to capture the feeling and how epic it all is. Doing a bit of research, obviously, for, for this, this interview, and I, I went back to your website and had a look and, and reminded myself of all the stuff you've done. And, and so some of your paintings, I think, are absolutely stunning. What I like is, is, is on there, there's a mix of print and paint and sketches and, and photography. And Tom mentioned that he really liked your photography because we all know those bits and pieces that you photographed on the ship, like even like door handles, sign steps, you know, the stuff that... It's instantly recognisable to us, but you, we would never have consciously thought of ever taking a picture of that, <laughs> which I think is really good. And for, and, and for me, I, I thought looking through your, your, the work that you've presented, I, I really like it when you photograph your sketchbooks or the, the scrapbooks, you know, when you, when you have a, a photograph of just a totally random bit of the deck next to a, a sketch of somebody that I know, next to a drawing of an animal. I, I, just, I thought they, were, those were, they really capture the whole atmosphere. Was there any, in amongst all that though, is there anything that, I mean, we brought you on two parts of that expedition, a hot one and a cold one, right? Tonga yeah. and the Arctic. In all that, is there a particular event that is the highlight for you? And is there a particular piece of work that you think really sums up your experience on there? Oh my goodness. Um, there, wouldn't, there, there were so many brilliant events and they're really different. So sometimes... Um, having not traveled a lot and traveling literally across the globe and then seeing the vessel at the dock. I mean, a fantastic moment that encompassed so many things, so much expectation and excitement, totally different to feeling seasick and not being used to knowing quite where to go on a vessel. And so, of course, I headed up to the sky bar at the top, at the front. So I'm pitching forward and backwards a, a lot more. I know I really wasn't seasick for long. It was, you know, just a couple of hours in the middle of the night. But for me, seeing the stars that I'd never seen, Southern Hemisphere stars, um, that's a painting that I haven't yet made that I've stored up. And um, I mean, the party, absolutely awesome party in Tonga, you know. I mean, there, there are so many moments, but they aren't always about excitement. They aren't always about a dive or the science. And I think going back to what you, you, how you mentioned about the, the photo sketchbooks, the reason they work is because some of those moments are really intimate. So I know that I've always got handrails in a lot of my photography because the handrail for me was the only thing separating me from this really deep ocean below me. That was quite interesting. It was also to give perspective. This wasn't just a picture of the sea from anywhere, from a bit of land. If you can only see the water, that it, the, the point was it was aboard the pressure drop. So it's kind of making those ideas accessible to people, but there are so many. I mean, the, the, the glaciers up in the Arctic. I mean, it, my work has got to a point of um, progression, but it's got so much further to go and there's so many more paintings to do. And in fact, the lino portraits, which, um, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they make it very, very accessible. You can see these epic characters that are playing out, whether it's a, a cook or an explorer or an engineer. They, they'll ultimately become a film poster, although there isn't a film to go with it. It's the film <laughs> is my experience. I thought it was really nice that you, you, you drew pretty much everybody on board. They work pretty, pretty hard. And, you know, they weren't obviously featured in the, in the TV documentary. And whenever we have journalists on board, there's normally a very small subset of people that get interviewed and stuff like that. So I thought it was great to see portraits of, of everybody. Uh, I thought it was a really nice thing to do. And, it, and it's, I think it's really nice for everyone who's on it. Whereas the, the high-end glossy documentary, I think there's pro- realistically, there's only going to be about five of us in it because they want that continuity rather than diversity. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, there's still a lot 
and I, I, there are a lot of uh, crew members um, and people I've still got to sketch and create linos for because what is it? It's over a hundred crew that are on rotation. Um, so you know, I won't be able to capture everybody, but I'm very aware of how the team only operates well because everybody's playing their part. So it's, uh, you can't have any one element that falls down, whether that's, you know, the, the cabin service, you know, the, the hotel sort of side staff of things or, or people that are doing the drinks and <laughs> making the food. What, what's next then? Because obviously five deeps is finished. And it's given you a taste of that. Is, is this, is this subject matter something you, you see yourself doing for the, for the immediate or long, longer term future or, 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 or something like this? Or, or do you think that once you've got all these paintings out of your head and down on, on canvas and, and, and all these sketches done, do you think then you're sort of reach saturation point? I think, right, I need to go and do something else. Go and do gorillas in the rainforest or something. <laughs> no, not at all, actually. Um, the science is really compelling. It's very interesting. And sometimes I have to re- remind myself not to go too far down the rabbit hole with science and try and keep the emotional aspect that I have with um, the experience. For instance, seeing your samples of giant isopods. I want to know so much about the isopods, but I don't want to know too much so that then I no longer see it as an artist. Uh, And I want to get that idea of the science and how exciting it is to see this phenomenally weird giant creature. I'd like to be able to convey that to the public and they don't get an opportunity to see that stuff. I love the idea of not explaining it because it ruins it. (laughs) I think that's wonderful. I totally know what you mean as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I've seen woodlice. I live inland. I've hardly ever been to see and certainly not travelled a lot. And suddenly I'm seeing a giant ice pod, which to me looks like a giant wood louse. And it's lovely and it reminds me of everything, my own sort of storytelling um, childhood, of whether it's a bug's life or um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, you know, even Alice in Wonderland, big and small. And it plays with all these other ideas. And I think art's got a really important role of bringing that magic and that connection to an audience. That's the nice bridge between science and the ex- explaining a little bit about it, but not too much, and allowing someone to own the image, I suppose. Did uh, Frank Lombardo ever tell you his giant isopod story? No. <laughs> I wouldn't say Frank was an artist, but this is a piece of performance art, I, w- I would say. Uh, he used to work in the Gulf of Mexico a lot, and he acquired a giant isopod, and so he, he hauled it out, took the guts of a remote control car, and stuck it into the shell of a giant isopod. And then- <laughs> Did it under the curtains of his house when he was having a big party and people were around drinking beer and stuff. Suddenly, this giant isopod would race across the floor and scare the absolute free Jesus out of everybody. No. So Wonderful. He until his dog ate it. A dog ate it. Nice. <laughs> ended up in the dog. I think that's absolutely fascinating. I think it's a really, really interesting take. I was thinking this recently because at the moment we're, we're currently writing up some of the data we got from the Mariana over the last five years or so. And, you know, our, one of our justifications for writing about the, the normal deep sea fauna you would expect to see there was historically we've known loads about bacteria in the bottom of the Mariana, molecular stuff, and we've known loads about geophysics, which I think is, is wonderful. So, you know, loads about bacteria and single cell stuff and unbelievably infinitely small things going on and then we know loads about two tectonic plates crashing together to create the trench and not much in between you know we start thinking about it like that it's like wow there really is a gap in this and then so what we're trying to do at the moment is try and fill in the, the sort of habitats as if you were walking around on that sort of scale rather than the scale of this thing it's two and a half thousand kilometers long trying to get that middle ground so yeah I, I, that's one of the things I, I genuinely find fascinating is you can go from how many times does a fish beat its tail in a minute to are there tectonic plates in a particular trench cracking in the middle? And it's still the same story. Isn't it fascinating how vast it is? I mean, I um, find it easier sometimes, you know, this sounds weird, but I find it easier to envisage descriptions of space and universe and that sort of side of physics than to comprehend just how much space is filled with water and pressure in the mm. oceans and in these trenches. Just the sheer scale of this habitat that we really don't know very much about is a bit staggering. It's a bit of a mind do. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of those issues come back to the, the a sort of anthropocentric thing whereby if you're trying to rationalise Mount Everest, you can see a picture of Mount Everest and go, there it is. 
Yes. Or even better, you can go there and stand there and look up and go, there it is. And all that information goes through the holes in your skull and says, right, I get that now. Or you go to the Grand Canyon and stand there and go, wow, that is huge. The problem with underwater is you can't see it. If all the information you get about, let's say, the Mariana Trench is in an abstract form. It's a, it's acoustic bathymetry, which has been colorized and vertically exaggerated and then given to you digitally or on a piece of paper and said, that's what the Mariana Trench looks like. No one has ever stood and looked at the Mariana Trench because you can't. And I think that's, that makes it much harder to then visualize. And, and, and also like the, the, the sheer size of the Pacific Ocean. I mean, if you turn the globe to the Pacific, it's pretty much half the planet is Pacific Ocean. So how you can never truly see that unless maybe if you're on the International Space Station, you might get a feel for just how huge it is. But I think it's to do with, it's a problem of scale and access. That makes yes. sense. Uh, there was a radio program, probably a podcast actually, that was talking about how inaccessible it is because it's cold, dark, it's down there and it's got a reflective surface and, and you can't get any of that perception as opposed to, as you say, looking up and being able to see something or envisage a distance. But I, I must say it's remarkable how much Five Deeps, how much that was able to achieve in terms of um, traversing it. I mean, just the idea of travelling through that much water yeah. is really interesting. But then the idea of a water column, that's really exciting. I don't, I mean, maybe I just didn't pay attention in science classes at school, but I think the idea of a water column is fascinating. And yet when you see it, I think a lot of um, textbooks or online resources tend to show it as a line with mm. a few options of what might live at each level. That's a real killjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I really enjoyed it when uh, you showed me some footage and I, I think it was the Java Trench and there was um, the Dumbo yeah. and no one had ever seen it that deep. I don't know, was it 8,000 metres or I don't it's know? 7,000 metres, yeah. Which, uh, that, that's phenomenal. Yeah, a bit like the snailfish. It hasn't got any bones <laughs> it's squishy i've always been not such a big fan of submersibles partly because they're very very expensive uh, and, there, and there's hardly any of them i don't think they're the solution to the world's ocean problems i think rovs you get more data if you like but there was always this argument about there's nothing being quite like than actually being in it and seeing it with your own eyes and and there is actually a real element of that which is hard to describe because when you're on the surface, you can see the, the wash and the bubbles and the, you know, it's bobbing up and down. So you can see the guys on the boat and then suddenly you just go boom and you start to sink. You can actually watch the sunlight disappear and it's very quick. And then you start to see these jellies and the lights and you see you fossils and all the rest of it. And then it's particularly Mariana Dive. We sat in that for three hours before it hit the bottom. And <laughs> every now and again, something cool would just whiz past the window. And then what I really liked, going back to like the snailfish and dumbo stuff, is when you finally get to the bottom, there's a sense that you've just walked in on somebody because there's a, like an animal there just doing what it was doing on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> right? it was just, and you feel a little bit intrusive, like you've just stuck your head through someone's window and went, what are you up to? And you don't get that from the landers when you, when you, when you bring it back and you download the video and then you, you see what you get. But from peering through the hole, it was, it's kind of personal. And it's particularly the Java one was the first time I ever saw a snailfish through the window. It was swimming up the same wall we were. It felt like, all right, so why are you going up here? <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's wonderful. And funny enough, that's one of the things that makes the art that I'm creating now different to where I was 18 months ago. Because I, I always struggle with using other people's photographs. I don't have permission, so I like to take my own photos. And yet I know that I can't take imagery from the deep sea with my own camera and my own eyes. And I really struggled with ROV images to a point because I couldn't Im imagine what it would be like to go down to those depths. And as soon as you have someone telling their story, like you just have, about what it's like to travel down losing that light spectrum and and seeing creatures in their own habitat, then when I'm now looking at your footage or photographs, I can see your experience of it. I can imagine myself looking in that way. And so then I can engage with the photo and I can turn it into a piece of artwork, which I just couldn't do before. They, it was just um, a little bit too removed for me. Right, so to finish off, we're going to ask you a personal question, which is the question we've been asking everybody. What's the best party that you've ever been to? <laughs> It's an important science and art question. 
I think it, there's absolutely no way you could be a party of the Kingdom of Tonga, South Pacific. I mean, just a ridiculous situation. It's amazing. Vessel, music, you and Fraser, like banging out the tunes on, on your guitars with the amp. Harmonica? Was there a harmonica? They were definitely margaritas. Was that was John the Sparky's first time he played harmonica in 30 years. Really? It was yeah, great. It was brilliant, yeah. First time you picked up a harmonica in 30 years. There was lots of dancing. There was lots of laughing and talking. There was singing. There was karaoke. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, that is a fantastic night. Really, really good. I remember playing an electric guitar and not realising it was heavily raining and wondering maybe I should switch this off. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't blow up. <laughs> the, the risk levels go up with a really good party. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Just listening into that as a as a spectator, guys, that was that was really good. That was the, the different take that we needed, and there were certain elements of that that got me really really excited. I loved you saying that you almost don't want to know too much about these things. Yeah. I never thought about that because our job is always to break it down and explain it. No, my reflex is is immediately like no no must teach must teach public outreach, but then I'm denying that emotion I had when I first saw something. So. We often talk about the things that get us really excited and, and, and about seeing something for the first time. I don't know about it, and that's why it's exciting, and that's why it's a surprise. You're not painting a perfect taxonomic representation of the animal. You are painting your first emotional response to seeing that thing for the first time. And that, we could poison that by telling you, and this works like that, and this works like that, and you find these at these depths, and they feed on this. And you know, Give yourself a moment to just take it in as it is. Yeah, yeah. But there's a thing we wrote about, remember, in that I wrote a paper with, with Tom and, and Glenn. It never, it's never really got published. In fact, it hasn't been published because I'm going to try and turn the whole thing into a bigger book. But you should look up phenomenology. Phenomenology is, is, a, is a, an area of philosophy which is about sense of awe. And this goes back to what I was saying about you can look at Mount Everest. There's absolutely no rational reason why you should like that. It's a mountain. It means nothing to you. It's, it, if whether it's there or not, it gives you nothing in terms of resources or safety or whatever it may be. But you like it. You look at it and you go, oh, yeah, look at that. And it's that little feeling of awe, phenomenological response, if you like. But you can't get that underwater because you can't stand there on the edge of the Mariana and go, look at the size of that. That's another sort of psychological barrier between how much people really love terrestrial landscapes and deserts and rainforests and hills and icebergs and all these wonderful things because you can see it and you get that gut feeling but everything underwater is just is buried it is it's essentially buried and you can't see it i remember you describing um and I, in fact i did look it up phenomenology um after i made so many noises at the whales the humpback whales that were breaching on the side of the, yeah. <laughs> the pressure job i remember um, tom blades is such an engineer he's like i wish these things would shut up i can't hear it <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know i think you know in art you get that moment where the artists are trying to capture that and it's the sublime i think that would be interesting it's a, it's a bit of a a challenge actually to see if I can capture some of that sublime feeling within an artwork within a deep sea where you can't necessarily contextualize. This was kind of came out of Tom's head this whole thing about the only way you can ever meet your deep sea fish is as if one of you were dead. You can't be in the same place at the same time one of us has to be dead. Yeah now if you think about when kids go to an aquarium you can go into an aquarium and you can see a fish swimming around doing stuff you could go down the beach or whatever and rivers and stuff and you can see animals that are alive and you get once again that sense of ownership or intimacy or, or sense of awe that you really like this animal but then the problem with deep water animals there's only two ways to see them one is digitally by video or stills or whatever it may be and the other is when they're bleached pale the eyes popping out sat in a jar of ethanol which isn't the best, doesn't make anybody look good. I, I think that's the, the fantastic thing about the sub, you see, because you've put people there. In the same way as you watch a film and you can identify with characters, you can uh, relate to part of the storyline, even though that's completely detached from your reality. And mm. as soon as you put other people in submersible, I think you can start to relate to those digital images. Then I think it does become more uh, accessible, perhaps. And then, of course, you don't have to be dead to see the fish, which is good. Always a point. <laughs> I was trying to avoid it. <laughs> I've avoided it so far. I know. 100% success rate. Survived every day, even the bad ones. Yeah. Statistically speaking, I cannot die. 
<laughs> yeah, no evidence to it. Anything else, Tom? I've done, I've done the Southern Hemisphere stars thing as well. Not consciously. Like, I have a sense for there's Orion, there's the North Star kind of thing. I didn't realise how much I internalised the night sky. And I didn't realise until the first time in New Zealand, out at sea, where you get that incredible full sky and your eyes have adjusted so you get Milky Way in there as well. Part of my brain had internalised enough to go, well, well, that's not right. That's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did I learn the stars? I, I didn't realise I'd internalised that. But uh, just that little like, oh, I am somewhere new. I'm, I'm, I'm at the other side of the world. Yeah, that's our fish out of water moment, really is. It's, there's nothing relatable anymore. Yeah. Scientists, you're out there. <laughs> Most people I know have all fallen into this by mistake. There's not many people that I know who have genuinely sort of went to university and says, I'm going to be a marine biologist or a group biologist, and then just went through the, the logical order. Most people that I've worked with have, have sort of fallen into this. I think if anyone followed the path of least resistance, if anyone went directly for it, you wouldn't bring anything new to the table. You know, Monty had come up with these heart rate tracking chips that he was using in the salmon, and that's what he brought to deep sea science, and that's what brought his way in if he if he'd always been a deep sea science guy he would have been quite blinkered he wouldn't have had that that wider technology it was murakami that said if you read the same book as everybody else you'll think like everybody else nice brilliant thanks very much uh i hope you've enjoyed yourself and i think what you've said so far has been absolutely brilliant i will leave you thank you very much so, cheers for <laughs> that. see you yeah. bye 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 that was really good another one in the bag that was an absolutely fantastic interview. I usually play sound tech and just sort of listen in just so you're not overwhelmed by too many different voices. I just found it too inspiring, far too interesting. And so I couldn't help but dive in at the end. Oh, that was that was so, so good. Do you imagine what would happen if we'd shown Alex the parasitic isopod devouring the tongue of a fish and the female anglerfish devouring their boyfriends? I can guarantee she would have a totally different take on that. Yeah. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to get in a position where we can assure that firsthand and just record her reaction to it. I want a spontaneous reaction, but like, let, let's warn her. Let's not like just turn up at her door and throw one at her. No, no, no. She just leaves them on her doorstep. Ah, oh, okay. Secret camera, candid camera. <laughs> Why aren't we nice to our friends? <laughs> no, no, it is nice because it's, 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 it's inspiration. She wants that gut reaction and that first, sort of first impression of it. So we're giving her what she wants by leaving oh, horrible helping. things on her doorstep. Oh, okay. All right. As long as we're helping, as long as it's all for the art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what, what, what our take home from that is, we think we're really smart because we can explain stuff, because scientists are a bit like that. And what she's saying is she would rather we were a pair of Johnny no splainers. <laughs> Stop talking and just let her have her fun. Just let her enjoy this stuff and don't ruin it by explaining why it's not interesting in the slightest. I think that was so useful. It's totally shifted my way of looking at these things. Because when people interview me and ask about, you know, what's the most exciting part of the job, it's that we go to new places, and when we get that memory card back out of one of our autonomous vehicles, we know there's a very good chance we're going to see something for the first time. And that's one of the things I think we've both talked about finding most exciting. And why do I want to take that away then? Let people have that sense of discovery and that sense of like, I've got no idea what this is and why it looks like that. I do think science education is important, outreach, and but yeah, let's give people a moment to really drink all that in and to see things the way that Alex does and then sidle up to them as we can see them enjoying a piece of art and just say, do you know why they have those barbels? <laughs> there is a third option here though as well. Is there? Oh, okay. You can be a Johnny Nosplainer and just say, look, just take what you want from it and be all inspired and, and see the magic and the unicorns and all. Or explain it or have it explained by a scientist and who makes it all boring and makes it very normal. The third option is we could just step in and lie. Oh, best of both. Just make up something completely ridiculous. And ah. then they go away thinking, my God, I've never heard of anything as bizarre as that. And we walk away going, well, we know we explain stuff just because it wasn't strictly true. It doesn't mean to say it, it hasn't served the purpose. <laughs> it certainly inspired that person. So when I sidle in and say, oh, do you know why they have those barbels? I can say, Wi-Fi, they're all on Reddit. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I just want to plug... Alex's site. So it's alexandragould.co.uk. A L E X A N D R A G O U L D.co.uk. I will put a, a link in the show notes. You should be able to find her. Well worth having an explore. I'm a big advocate for the fish, and I love that she does them as portraits. I think she captures 
you know, not as a strict taxonomic drawing, but I think she captures their essence. They're in situ and they're alive and they're how I want people to experience deep sea fish, not from from damaged and preserved samples. But the one I really need to shout out, check out a, a painting she did called Above and Within. And it's got this, this really brutal lighting. She paints in a way, or at least within these, these paintings, where light almost has a mass. It's almost a liquid. It's, it's got this real heaviness to it. But this particular painting, I love the, the brutal, brutal asymmetry. You've got the vessel on the right, which takes up most of the canvas. You're sort of looking below the ocean as well, and you can see the little sub. And right down to the, the vessel is really angular, and then the sub has really rounded shapes to it. And I just, I just keep looking at it. I really, really like it. It's, uh, it's this brutal juxtaposition. To get back to just the pure aesthetics of these animals and people's initial emotional response to them, because, I, I mean, it's something we try and train out of ourselves to be objective. But there's something to be said, and it's it's a, absolutely how the general public interact with these animals. So do you have any thoughts on aesthetics, Alan, on the, how these animals appear and how we view them? I think the aesthetics of these things are really important, particularly in deep sea. It's probably in the same in all of the natural world, because there are things that we like to look at, it's things that we don't like to look at. If you look at the cockroach, it's an amazing animal. Absolutely a stunning, amazing animal, but they get a bit of a bad rep. But I think in deep seas, there's probably bigger, more important issues which do relate back to just how things look. So sticking with fish for a bit, because we're fishy guys, right? If you ask someone, what, what does the deepest fish in the world look like? They'd probably conjure up some sort of weird image of a scaly, black, stealthy monster thing with bioluminescent lures and fangs and spiny fins and demonic eyes and things lurking and hunting you in the dark and all that and kind of And all stuff. those things only being on it to upset you, not to serve a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> but it wouldn't be something that's relatable or something that felt familiar. It'd be, you know, it's, it's going to be quite far removed from the fish that we eat or or you would keep as a pet or you'd see in an aquarium, right? You're talking about this stuff of nightmares. It's important to stress that these fish do exist. You look at the hatchet fish, the fang tooth, lantern fish, dragon fish, viper fish, and the angler fish we were talking about earlier. These all do exist, but it comes back to what Alex was saying about once you start to reverse engineer them or try to explain it, you kind of take that magic away from it because the monster doesn't exist. The monster exists in your imagination, right? But once you start to break apart that animal and say, why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? Why is it doing this? It kind of makes perfect sense. It's like the smelly engineering thing we're talking to Monty about. There's two things that come up here. One is a lot of these animals that we, we see a lot as sort of representatives of the deep sea, the usual suspects, are actually not that deep. In the grand scheme of things, they're not that deep. They tend to be in an area we call a twilight zone. So a twilight meaning there's a little bit of light, you know, it's top thousand metres, say. And the other thing is they're also not that big. They're actually kind of small. I was always surprised when I first got into this when, you, you know, you, I was already aware of things like lanternfish and, and particularly hatchet fish and stuff like that. And you see them for the first time, real, and you're like, oh, yeah. oh they're, it's they're tiny. They're really, really <laughs> creative with the filming in these. Because, of course, like, like we said, the, the monster element sells, but a lot of these things are really zoomed in. You know, the, the, the anglers, some of them are, are get to sort of the size of a football, and one's even called the football fish, I think. Uh, but most are about the size of yeah. your thumb. So... Basically, when you take that cohort of, of monsters, the ones that everyone sort of puts in their mind and going, oh, these horrible things. Yes, they are deep sea fish, but I wouldn't say they're characteristically deep sea fish. I would say they're dark sea fish. Because all of those adaptations, the bioluminescence is to do with light. It's to do with living in the dark. The black bodies, the, the, the spiny fins are, are, are there to hold position midwater when you're just sort of doing everything you can to bring other animals to you. You're like a floating bear trap. And it's all to do with living out your existence in a very dark, very empty three-dimensional space. I think the 3D part's a big part of it. Yeah, and it's it, you're just in that whole midwater bit that's that's a very different environment. And it's not necessarily... I know that the, the, the low light business is partly to do with being deep, but I would class them as dark sea fish rather than deep sea fish. And I think the, the point what I'm trying to make is when you ask people what does the deepest fish in the world look like, they go down the most ridiculous dark sea fish they can imagine. They assume the ones that they know about and then again crank it up yeah they would, they would assume it would be one of those but more yeah but i say most of them are probably in the top 10 top 20 percent of the ocean you know these nightmarish things tend to sort of map nicely onto you know your inherent fear of the dark they're not necessarily representative of the deep sea i think most of the adaptations to depth or pressure if you like are happening on a molecular level there are not many things that you look at and you can say oh that's a deep sea fish because it's got that Right. I think the, the, the weird thing about a lot of the deep sea fish is that they're pale or brown or a bit sort of woebegone, and that's because they don't care about light. We've noticed some um, pigmentless forms yeah. within populations. Our current theory is that these would be eradicated, these genes would be removed in any other population, but because what they look like doesn't matter, you get these 
beautiful creamy white pure white individuals as part of the the general population because they're not being punished by uh by reduced survivability for that what you're saying is why go to the bother of being fabulous when you live in the dark they're beautiful though but the the creamy <laughs> white cusk eels are uh, are really pretty and eels as well we've seen but some of the examples of that are what we're talking about. Let's bookend this deepest fish thing. The deepest fish in the world is a snailfish. You've probably heard us talk about these before. They are not exactly the stuff of nightmares. If anything, you feel a bit sorry for them. They're small, they're semi-transparent, they're pink. They've got a kind of goofy grin, small little beady eyes. They kind of move like tadpoles. The coolest thing about snailfish isn't the fact that they're the deepest in the world and most of the big trenches have a, have a snailfish in it. What I like about snailfish is that family, which is called Leparidae, is a shallow water family. There's a species of bizarre little pink shallow water fish which have radiated across the oceans and descended down deeper than the biggest, gnarliest, weirdest deep sea fish you can think of. And they've beaten it, if it's a game, that is. So they're kind of cool. Their vertical distribution, it, it's not possible for them to get further. There are snailfish living in rock pools. Yeah. And there are snailfish as the deepest fish on Earth. There's estuarine ones, isn't there? Yes, there are. Yeah, it's an incredibly successful family, but not, doesn't in any way fit that stereotype of what the deepest fish in the world should look like. But then if you move into other animals, for example, look at the biggest of the big, you know, the last of the big crustaceans at depth is what we call pinnades. They're kind of like shrimpy prawn type of crustaceans, great big, beautiful red things. And they are the deepest of all what we call the decapods, which is the crabs, prawns, lobsters, shrimps. Ten legs. Yeah, decapod, ten legs, ten footed. They are all over the place. We've seen them through the Indian Ocean, up through all the Western Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, up the Atlantic. And they seem to be quite happy down to depths of nearly 8,000 metres. Uh, and they don't look weird at all. They don't. They wouldn't look out of place lying in a fish market at all, right? So there's nothing weird about even the deepest of that huge animal group. And then, of course, recently we found the deepest octopus in the world, and it was just a little dumbo. If anything, it's kind of cute and kind of interesting to see it just foraging around, being a dumbo, doing its thing. And again, there was nothing weird about that. And I like the dumbo as well because of the how the octopus has played such a huge part in seafaring folklore about, you know, the tentacles coming out of the sea and pulling ships down and everything else. And, you know, that whole visual imagery of the octopus and historical seafaring is being horrendous. And the deepest of them all is this little foot-long dumbo. It's quite nice colours as well. Yeah. A pink and purple to it. Yeah, I mean, you could could have shown a lot of people that video and not explained it was deep and they would never have guessed that that was actually close to 7,000 metres underwater. The gut feeling would have been that it was it was cute. Yeah. Yeah, so if you take animals even deeper than that, the animals that live at the very, very deepest point, that you have these anemones in the bottom of Challenger Deep, which, again, are animals, they're not plants, but they look a hell of a lot like very, very delicate white flowers. And they're just there sort of swaying in the current like a, like a flower would sway in the wind. And there's genuinely nothing fearsome about that. It's actually actually quite beautiful. And then you look at all these other animals like gastropods and brittle stars and polychaetes and so on. The aesthetic of them doesn't change with depth. I would imagine most animals, they don't. It's only the big characteristic ones, the big uh, charismatic megafauna ones probably do. But generally speaking, there's nothing that weird about being deep. Essentially, what I've got is uh, dark sea creatures are stealing the limelight away from the real deep sea creatures, right? So that gives a false impression of the natural aesthetic of most of the deep sea community because we're concentrated on on possibly the, the worst, but they are not representative of anything that lives on the seafloor. As I say, these live up in this dimly lit pelagic midwater. These dark sea animals, they've, they've adapted to this low light in a way that kind of drags your fingernails down your imagination blackboard and true deep sea animals have done nothing at all in terms of their aesthetic or, or, or alternatively they've just abandoned their evolutionary desire to look fabulous. I use the word fabulous in a very non-scientific way, but some animals do, right? Could I juxtapose that? Go for it. I think that we are looking at them as ourselves and not as each other. They see each other through their bioluminescence, which is beautiful, which is fabulous. No, I'm thinking more like, you know, coral fish and, and river fish and stuff like that. They've got lots of patterns, they've got lots of nice fins, they've got displays, they've, you know, it means a lot, their, their life history of, of their, their aesthetic is really important to the survival of the species. You get down deep, what they actually look like means nothing. Uh, but th what I'm saying is it's what they look like to us when we bring them up and we shine a light on them. What they look like to each other is these beautiful shimmering coloured yeah. illuminescent displays. It's a bit like you, Tom, you see. So if you you know, normally you're quite well dressed and well turned out, and then you come come lockdown, it's just analogous with descending into the deep sea, you've just let yourself go. No, that's very true. I, I, yeah. I feel like I've descended into darkness. There's a poorly maintained beard, there's a mohawk. Why bother with, with colour and pattern in the deep sea and why bother wearing trousers during lockdown? <laughs> It's the same thing. But there are, there, there are some important points you made about aesthetics. So if you think about the way in which scientists 
approach the deep sea in a highly objective way, like what Alex was talking about. You're right, we're there to give a coherent account of the structure of that environment and, and explaining observations. The layperson, I guess, is more likely to develop different perspectives based on alternative sources, right? The, you know, the sort of media type of stuff. And that can be quite highly skewed from the perspective of scientists. What does, what, what do normal people do with that information, right? That aesthetic. So it's, let's say, for example, say, right, deep sea animals, tell me about deep sea animals, and they automatically think about these dark sea ones, these pelagic ones. Right there, you're you're entering into a difficult question, which gets asked often at conferences and, and various other deep sea things. Is why don't people care about deep sea? I mean, why don't people care about you know conservation and why do they want not want to know a lot more than they already do? And that comes down to something called axiology, which is the sort of relationship between aesthetic and ethics. Like ethically, if you take away the monetary value, right? Let's say the money is not involved in this. What is it about the deep sea that you that can give you that you care about? And that's aesthetic. It's whether you like it or not. And axiology is about how much the aesthetics of something influences your ethics. So if it's full of weird monsters and, and, and creatures and all the rest of it, and or it's a lifeless, barren, you know, nothingness sitting in the bottom of the planet, that is going to affect your ethics. You're not going to sit there and go, right, this is it. I, I want to protect the entire episode playing in the Pacific Ocean because these horrible little fang-toothed monster things that want to eat the eyes out of my skull are really important. You don't think yeah. like that, right? And I guess this is why some of the big terrestrial animals get a lot of attention, because people look at them and they think, oh, that's lovely. I'm going to donate £10 to that charity because I want to keep that lovely animal going. But as soon as you go in the water, you start going down and you end up thinking, okay, these things, these are not things that the normal people care about. Although I know there are weird people who do care about them. Well, I think the ones the ones that we brought up already, the, there's Team Monster, and I, I, I actually Googled before we started this one. There isn't, or at least I couldn't find a Save the Monsters t-shirt, but I'm sure one exists. I need to find that. So yeah, there's some people who really engage with the monsters, but they seem to be a minority. But when we publish some of our stuff online... I never read the comments section. One of the, the top comments is, oh, I'm glad we're destroying the ocean. I'm never going in the sea again. It's fear. Our next episode, we should talk to somebody about fear. Yes. Because that's what's underpinning all of this is the fear of the dark and the fear of deep water, which is an archetypal fear, which makes a lot of sense when you think that we are visually orientated, ear-breathing monkeys. Sorry, Tom, but you are. I am. Anyway, so you had something similar about that recently, about that classic blobfish photograph that I think it's something that you need to get off your chest. I think it's something you need to just 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 bottle it right up and then just deliver. Yeah, the injustice, the bullying. It, it sort of stems from you talking about charismatic animals, your leopards and your pandas and things like that. They they immediately gather public support. So there was a uh, a campaign started by Simon Watt, who's a uh, a biologist who presents a lot on on conservation. And back in 2013, he had a world's ugliest animal competition, and the whole point of it was to raise awareness for the animals that are harder to protect because people don't engage with them so much. Uh, one of his profile pictures is him with a, a placard that just says, save the slug. And often these animals are the ecosystem foundation. If the giant pandas disappear, as tragic as that would be, the giant pandas would disappear. But if you remove some of these ugly animals, they're, they're the foundation of whole ecosystems and the whole thing comes tumbling down. So I really like what Simon was doing, but the, the winner of that campaign was the blobfish. Uh, this was back in 2013. And you can all visualize that classic image. It's sort of pink, it's really deflated and sad looking. Actually, that, that image was taken by some friends of ours at uh, Niwa as part of their Seamount expedition. And then that sort of went viral and I've, I've seen it all over the internet. It's very memeable. It's, it's uh, this sad, deflated, jelly-like fish. There's even a Star Wars character based on it. Is there? The big, weird pink guy who sells inflatable pies for scrap metal. That dude apparently is based on that classic photograph of the blobfish. There is one in, I think it's Men in Black 3 as well. It's in the background of the scene. Question is, Tom, how representative is that photo of the blobfish? Well, this is where I get upset because it's bullying. It's online bullying. So the blobfish, not super deep sea, about 2,000 metres. You find them off New Zealand, which is where that original photo was taken. They're a low energy fish and they don't have a swim bladder. So they don't have that internal balloon that allows them to maintain their buoyancy in the water. So what they've done is they've reduced all the hard parts of their body, they've reduced their, their bones, and they've filled their body with a gel. It's roughly neutral in water. So that's all fine when you're a deep sea animal because the water supports it in life. The issue is then when you bring that animal to us, it ends up looking very different. A, a fair comparison would be if you took me and you captured me in a bag and you pulled me up in this mesh bag into space and you dragged me across the surface of the moon and then you put me in five times my normal gravity 
and I was damaged and deflated and collapsing under these extreme conditions that I, my body never evolved to cope with. And then took a picture of that and say, like, oh, human beings are gross, aren't they? They're terrible. These animals are incredibly fragile and, and trawling does quite a lot of damage. The whole reason the blobfish is pink is because its skin has been rubbed off. In, in life, they're sort of a, a dusky olive green almost. Uh, and we took some pictures of blobfish again off New Zealand and they're not beautiful fish. Uh, they're quite chunky looking. I, I quite like how they look. It is not done justice by that image. And that feeds back into how we know and how we interact with deep sea fish. Because as Alan mentioned in that interview, a lot of them are pickled in, in jars, maybe from the, the expeditions of 50 to 70 years ago. And they've been damaged by the trawling process. They've had explosive decompression. And then because they have such fluid filled bodies, such low density bodies, when you preserve them in formalin or alcohol, all that's pulled out. And so they shrivel and they become they become sort of far more disgusting in the very pure sense of the term, but also dis distorted. It's not it's not the animal as it exists in life. But one of the, the point we're trying to make is because it's a deep sea animal, nobody questions it. You just see this animal which has been absolutely butchered and go, look how ugly this thing is. And everyone goes, wow, that's ex that's exactly what I want. I want to think that that's what's lurking in the bottom of the sea. And no one, I don't recall anyone ever going, hold on, that doesn't look right. That looks like it's melting on a table, right? And so, of course, it's melting on a table. But funnily enough, it hasn't evolved to adapt to the environmental conditions of a table. <laughs> so, or being dragged upside down through a trawl net across the seafloor, for example. It sits along line our preconceived notions of what deep sea animals look like more than it does anything else. And I think, interestingly, they're preconceived because we've only been getting cameras down there relatively recently. I think Monster Camera was the first one in the late 60s, early 70s that actually got footage of deep sea fish in life. And so that was our, our understanding, was these damaged specimens that had been preserved in alcohol from the big global expeditions, you know, the Challenger, the Galathea expeditions. That was all we knew of deep sea animals. And so that's not been updated yet because it turned out that that got clicks, that sold newspapers. The monstrous sort of damaged view that we used to have of these animals is now their brand. And so there's almost a reluctance to move away from that. Do you think we could get hold of a blobfish and push it through Alex Gould's letterbox and see how she responds to that? She would love it. They, they do cuddly toys now. They are quite cute. You know? It's not the same as the real deal coming to your letterbox, is it? Yeah, it would be horribly damaged by doing that, but maybe that would prove a point. Yeah. <laughs> but let's face it, we don't have a blobfish to push through a letterbox. It's not going to happen anyway. And that's the only thing stopping us. <laughs> But as soon as we do, right? As soon as we do, box. I know where they're going. Just imagine the art, Tom. Imagine the art that will come out of that. Art often stems from suffering, and apparently being friends with us is a source of a great deal. Anyway, I've, if we're going to talk about art, Tom, I've got a poem for you. Wow, we're getting well off the science on this one. Right. It's not a poem written by myself. This is written by a nine-year-old girl called Lucy. So there's a story behind this. Lucy is probably now certainly a late teenager, I guess. Back in the day when we were in Aberdeen, we, we did this thing with school kids and they all had to write a poem. And there's one of them that just totally stood out. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. And it's called The Halo's Own Rhyme. Nice. I think this is the only episode we're going to get away with this because we're already a wee bit arty. So she says, Way down the ocean, 600 metres and more, there's a really cool place that she'd like to explore. It's called the Hale Zone after Greek god Hades. It's dark and it's deep, and to get there takes ages. The zone is not part of the ocean bed. It is described as canyons or trenches instead, and though human could dive there, the pressure's too great. Like being crushed by a whale, not one, but eight. The trenches are deep, as Mount Everest is tall. That's the world's highest mountain, the greatest of all. If you think that's impressive, here's another interesting fact. More people have been to the moon than the Hadel and back. No sunlight reaches this zone and it's cold, even the oxygen down there is old. It's an impossible place for plants to survive, but believe it or not, it has species that thrive. There are crustaceans and jellyfish and even some worms, and so many creatures, and so much to learn. There are amphipods, decapods, and slimy cucumbers, all making their home in this deep place down under. Isn't that brilliant? That's wonderful. I thought that was quite cool. So I've kept that one. So thanks, Lucy. When you were nine, that was brilliant. Pretty damn accurate. She's obviously paid attention during the lecture. I know, I love it. I think it's great. If by any massive fluke you're listening, Lucy, one, well done, and two, say hi. So for this episode's Tales from the High Sea, I thought we'd cast the net a little bit wider and we have Dr. Heather Ritchie. Hello. Hello, Tom. <laughs> uh, we've sailed together a lot. We've had a few adventures over the years. Just a couple. <laughs> in some less than favourable conditions. Yeah, adventures, definitely. Could I, could I share one that I think sets the scene quite well for you? You can maybe provide your, your side too. We did one cruise which was particularly hard going. We lost a lot of gear. We were... 
mullered by a massive storm on the way out. It, it's the hardest job we've all done. And, and weirdly, it turned out to be one of the most scientifically interesting, so it did pay off. But morale was really low. We were gathering on deck to do another 16-hour day in intense heat, and we just needed a bit of a pick-me-up. And then emerging from the cabins, fully decked out in the safety gear as well. Of course. Came Heather fully resplendent in a Wonder Woman outfit of incredible detail. Like it went right down to the socks. Your socks had capes. Oh, the capes. socks had capes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a regular cape, of course, because you can't be Wonder Woman without the regular cape. But the, the socks also had capes. But they were detachable capes. So, you know, if there was a problem, if you felt it was going to be like a trip hazard or something, you could just Velcro those bad boys off. But it was a three cape kind of day. <laughs> we did. We needed those extra capes. We needed sock capes. And that gets over the Incredibles problem. That gets over the, the no capes safety issue. They never touched upon quick remove capes. Right. That's it. You've got, if you're going to wear a cape, it has to be easily detachable. So you can change up depending on, you know, HSE requirements at any time. <laughs> Yeah, it was just, I didn't really plan it. I mean, I took, I obviously took the outfit with me. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure why. You know, my mind's eye was like, I, I think you need to take the Wonder Woman stuff with you. It was some destiny. It just, it felt like the, the cruise when I was packing was just like, well, you know, if you don't need it, that's fine. You don't want to be caught without it when it's Tom, needed. Tom, imagine if I had woken up that day and I didn't have that in my repertoire. What, what, what would we have done? I, it would have been the end for all of us. At that point, one of the items that got destroyed on the boat was the washing machine. <laughs> so we were all washing our clothes in the shower. <laughs> so just stamping them down with soap. So it, and there was no dryer, so everything was just sort of... Getting crispy in the sun. <laughs> crispy but still somehow musty yeah i just i put it on and i didn't tell anyone it just came out to breakfast <laughs> this is where i am mentally today it was exactly what was needed and it's absolutely why you're a team player and a good one to have offshore <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes episode three of the deep sea podcast thank you for joining us on the next episode we are going to track down someone who can talk to us about the psychology of the deep sea and where that fear comes from the subconscious and the fear of the darkness and the fear of deep open water and we're going to have some fun unpacking that basically because i really enjoyed delving into aesthetics and art in this one as well um so we're going to throw the net broad again on the next episode and I've noticed uh, a lot of the popular podcasts seem to have sort of regular, almost catchphrases. So I'm going to start trying out catchphrases on these. So uh, from me and Alan, we'll deep see you next time. No, that's not happening. No, no. Oh, come on. No, what, no, 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 <laughs> no, that's terrible. No. It's in there now. I edit. All right, you can have it, but we want a different one for next week. Right, so it's not staying. It can only stay for Let's one. Let's deep see what you come up with next week. So from me, Tom, and especially from Alan, we'll deep see you next time. this was supported by our company Amatus Oceanic. If you want to explore the deep sea yourself, uh, we can help you do that. But if you want to bring the deep sea to your audience, if you want facts and storytelling about the deep sea, then we can help with that also. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of a new podcast called The Lighter Side of the Moon. My name is Dr. Luna Eclipse um, and I'm also joined by Dr. Perry Helian. Hello there. Now, Perry, why is it that we love the moon? Uh, what is the, the national obsession with it? Well, I think uh, for me personally, the reason that I like the moon is that it gives us uh, someone to blame when we act uh, crazy. Um, also, it's a very dry atmosphere, generally dry. Uh, I like that. Um, it brings us tidal offerings, you know, uh, plastic, driftwood, sea glass, that sort of thing, washing up. And also the moon is responsible for giving women periods.
Oh, well, thank you for that. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, me personally, I've always been obsessed by the moon. Uh, we were also talking about sort of um, science in general and how we would rate the different sort of scientific jobs that people can do. And I put together a little list of my favourite, my favourite scientific callings. I think astrophysicists would be at the top, uh, along with archaeologists. Coming in at number three, astrologists. Mystic Meg. Uh, whatever happened to her? She was very interesting. Yes, absolutely. And um, at the bottom, ironically, I put uh, marine biologists. Um, I mean, they probably like that because they like being at the bottom of things, don't they? And my main issue with that is what is it that they're trying to hide? Why is it that they have this obsession with going as deep as possible as they can into the ocean? What's really down there? Well, Dr. Perry Helian, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And we uh, look forward to seeing you all on episode two. Thank you very much.